Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Stroh. This is the State of Mind podcast. On today's episode, we have Matt Zerker, the founder and CEO of Tether, a peer-enabled men's mental health support app, community, etc. He shares an incredible story of how he created the, or I should say, maybe what motivated him to create this app. He left a high paying job in the finance industry as a result of some personal experiences and has dedicated his time since then to creating a place for men to receive support. Men die by suicide almost three times as much as women. And we also have some sort of societal norm where men are less likely to ask for help, less likely to be honest about what's going on inside of them. And that is not helpful. So we are trying to broaden that conversation. We are trying to open people up and hopefully we can create more space, more opportunities for men to reach out for help and get the help. It doesn't always have to be professional help. Sometimes just speaking to a friend or somebody you trust is incredibly empowering. So without further ado, I bring you Matt Zerker. So I, I did a little introduction prior, but Matt, I always think it's best when the guest introduces themselves and describes a little bit about what you're doing and why, why you're here doing this work. So if you can explain that and, and share whatever you think is pertinent for you right now, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. And and by the way, thank you, Mike, for uh, for having me on. Um, I you know I appreciate all the opportunities that I get to sort of share about Tether and and my story. Um, it helps me as well. Um, it helps me sort of stay grounded in uh, what I'm doing and and what I'm trying to build. And sometimes I think you know we can kind of get you know a little bit lost in in sort of the day to day and and you know it feels it can feel rudderless and chaotic and stuff like that and so uh these these types of things allow me to just sort of come back to like why I'm doing this which is you know important for me um i uh, you know i guess there's i'm going to try and do it as short a version of the long story uh as i possibly sure. can um, I, you know, I've, been, I've dealt with, you know, mental health issues my entire life. Uh, I guess I should start off by mentioning that uh, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Tether, uh, which is a peer enabled mental health and well being platform for men. Um, and what we want to do is we want to provide, uh, you know, any man that's struggling, uh, anyone that identifies as a man who's struggling uh, with a safe barrier free space where they can speak openly. Uh, connect with other men on the basis of, you know, uh, shared life experience and, and get access to the mental health and well-being resources that they need. Um, and so for us, this this peer support channel uh, is a hugely important component uh, of how we we sort of just normalize, uh, you know, struggle, right? And I think that's the biggest thing that we, we don't do uh, for each other as men. We're, you know, we don't hold space for uh, for struggle. And, and I think that there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, you know, most notably is, I guess, this outdated structure of like what it means to be a man, right, where we're supposed to be resilient and unemotional and, you know, all of these things that basically put a lid on how we're actually feeling. And, and what's so unfortunate about that is that uh, it actually prevents guys from seeing uh, themselves and seeing their struggle in another person and actually normalizing that for themselves. So I think, you know, because we've been told all of this stuff, because since we've been little boys, we've been told to like, you know, persevere, push through, man up, you know, whatever that that phrase is that you want to, uh, you know, you want to say, like, that's kind of kept a lid on how we truly feel. And, and I think for a lot of men, they just don't see struggle as an option. They don't see getting help uh, as an option. So one of the most powerful things I think, you know, we have built is just a way for men to be able to sort of see themselves in other men and, and to really say, okay, there's other guys out here who are going through this, who feel pain, uh, who are struggling. Uh, and, and you know what, maybe it's a little bit okay for me to, to struggle as well. Maybe it's okay for me uh, to get some support. Um, and I think that modeling behavior is a, is a hugely powerful piece. And I think, you know, if, one of the things one of my partners said the other week, which was really interesting, is like, if you took kind of all the men that are struggling 
with some form of anxiety, depression, stress. I think it's like 77% of guys uh, feel that way, that they're struggling with something. Um, and then 61% of the population feels like they're left out, misunderstood, lonely, isolated. And these are all things that have gotten worse uh, in COVID. And so if you think about just that number, there is not enough mental health professionals, therapists, social workers, psychiatrists. There's not enough people to, 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 to actually serve that entire part of the population. And so peer support is an absolutely critical piece of, of this collective mental health effort and this collective focus on it. Like if we're not supporting each other uh, you know, and, and we're not, you know, we're not actively holding space for what each other are going through. Um, I, I think, you know, we just don't really have the, the power, the, the, the ability to actually fully serve the entire population. And so while one out of five people is dealing with some kind of mental health issue, I would say that five out of five people need support sometimes, right? Like we, we all need somebody that we can chat with. Uh, and so what we're building is a way for, you know, men to connect honestly, openly to be able to show vulnerability. And so that's a huge part of, of what we're building and, and how I got here. Um, you know, I, I, I've dealt with mental health issues my entire life. Um, and, you know, anxiety, depression, a lot of social anxiety. Um, I was bullied very heavily a, a, as a child and, and that definitely left a, a pretty lasting impact on my psyche in terms of feelings of worthiness and, you know, not feeling like I fit in, you know, always feeling like I had to perform or uh, present or, you know, do something to compensate for the fact that I didn't feel like I was enough. And throughout the years, it's been different things, right, that I've used to sort of fill that that hole uh, that I feel within myself. And, and still, like, and, and I want to be very clear, like, I'm here today talking to you as, like, the founder of, a, you know, a men's mental health company, but I still feel that hole. Like, I, I, I still feel like I'm doing work, and I'm still doing work daily and, and you know we chatted about this right before i got on it's like i i never want anyone to think that i've figured something out uh, because like i still have days where i lie in bed i i still have moments where i'm so overwhelmed that i need to lie on the couch and just breathe and like kind of hold my chest uh so i think that's it's really important to say that because i think so often in these conversations we kind of lose um the fact that the people talking to you know whoever's listening uh, are you know hopefully doing this work themselves but i just think it's 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 you know it's it's part of this whole you know well-being you know motivational movement where it seems like the person talking about it has kind of fixed the issue and and i never want that to be the case i want people to know that uh you know i'm still going through this uh so you know all of that you know in my in my teens like you know uh, i had you know problems with food you know overeating binge eating things like that so that was the way that i did it when i was like 13 14 15 uh then you know in high school it became you know cigarettes booze drugs things like that you know pretty standard path especially uh considering you know when you know went to an arts high school uh there was a lot of you know partying and things like that and mm -hmm. and it was kind of I, I felt like, you know, I, I really finally wanted to experience feeling like I, I kind of fit in. Uh, I started to get like kind of that feeling towards the end of high school. U ultimately, it was like an empty feeling, right? Because it was just based on, you know, feeling like I was hanging out with the right people. But I, I go to university and then I really kind of went off the, you know, the, the deep end, you know, in my first two years when I went to Western uh, with, you know, booze and, and uh, you know, drugs and things like that. Uh, and that was uh, a, a, a difficult time for me, but it was also a time where I, I felt um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of connection in a weird way, because like, I did finally kind of feel like I had that friend group that I always wanted. And so it was a very difficult time for me in the sense that I felt like I was getting something that I needed, but then I knew that I wasn't being good to myself either. Uh, and, and then, you know, in my twenties, it was all about performance and achievement. And, you know, I did my CFA. I became a portfolio manager at a quantitative hedge fund here in Toronto. So as you can sort of see, like, you know, just replacing one thing with another thing, you know, whether it was achievement or food or drugs and alcohol, there was always something that I was trying to use to fill up this space that I felt like was empty in, in, inside of me. And, and so while I had this outward, you know, I guess, look of success, you know, in my own home, making good money, career, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, inside, I still felt that emptiness. And 
Uh, it wasn't until 2018 that I kind of had one of those moments that that really changed everything for me. Um, and it was uh, it was the very sudden passing of one of my best friends. Um, and we lived across from each other in this townhouse complex. And it was uh, it was a really devastating experience. It was my first time, uh, I think, you know, where death feels like it's not just somebody of the older generation passing on it doesn't feel natural it felt like very abnormal and very dislodging for me um and, and it really sent me into you know the darkest deepest depression i've been in my life i i, I tell people a lot of the time it's like I, I didn't feel like dying but i didn't feel like you know i wanted to live and it was this really horrible intermediate spot where you're just like it just feels like you're surviving right? It just feels like every day is just about survival. And it's a miserable place to be. And I have a tremendous amount of empathy for people that are there now. And even some days still, man, it feels like I'm just trying to survive. Um, and, and so, you know, that's a piece of my work. And, you know, you and I chatted a bit about self-love. And I think that's kind of my journey right now is, is really around self-love. But, you know, my, my friend passes away. Um, I, I can't get out of bed. Uh, I'm crippled by anxiety. Um, I, I go on mental health leave at work. I start trying therapy, medication, experimental treatments, you know, you name it. Um, and then out of the blue, kind of one day, an old friend of mine comes back into my life and, and he asked me if I want to join a men's group with him. And I, at this point, I was like, well, you know, I've tried everything. So I'll give this one a go too as well. I mean, it can't hurt, right? Um, and there was something very different about that that first encounter. You know, it was for the first time um, what I realized was like in hindsight, you know, even well after going to that first meeting is that I never really felt safe around men. I had never felt safe expressing myself around men. There was always this, uh, this fear that, you know, they were going to sort of see me as like a child or, uh, you know, not man enough or, or something like that. And so I never really felt safe expressing. And, and even if I did ever get to express, I would have horrible anxiety and shame afterwards for even sharing anything. And I'd just be like, oh my God, they're never going to call me again. You know, what have I done? I shouldn't have told them that, right? And that was kind of the loop. But in, in this moment, it kind of felt safe. Um, and they, they just sort of held space for me. And they said, you know what? We're here for you. And, and it's okay the way that you feel. Um, and, and it was a really powerful moment. I didn't really know what happened in that moment, but I kept kind of going to the group. Uh, and then I decided eventually that I was going to go to a men's retreat down in, in Massachusetts and, and kind of dive deeper into something that was actually starting to shift and, and move stuff inside of me. Again, don't know why I did it. Went down to this retreat. Fortunately, went down uh, with one of the guys from my group that I had met now uh, and had become you know, closer with. Um, and that, that retreat again was a huge, uh, opening for me. Um, uh, I had been dealing with panic attacks where I'd been waking up into panic attacks for like a period of, I don't know, se you know, seven to 10 months every day. And, and it wasn't like I would get a panic attack sometime during the day. It was like, I'd wake up into a panic attack. And that was just miserable because you could never really enjoy your mornings. It was just like, you were always coming down off of you know anxiety and fear and stuff like that and it was just really an awful way to start the day and i i went on this retreat and i did what was called like a healing journey or some people call it a hero's journey uh, and you basically go very deep somatically into an experience uh that was formative for you and for me it was a, a bullying experience and at the end of it, I was sweating. I had cried. I had screamed. I had yelled. I had released all of this sort of trapped anger that was that was inside of me that I had been pinning down for so many years. <clears throat> and the next morning, I woke up, and for the first time in you know, it felt like forever. Um, I was able to actually wake up and and just enjoy the feeling of the sheets on my body and the light that was coming in through the window. Um, there was some semblance of peace and I was like, you know, what's, what's going on here? Um, so I finished the retreat. It was a great experience. Uh, you know, it was a formative experience for me. Um, and I come back to Toronto on a Monday and I sit down at my desk at work and I just, I'm like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. It's just, this is not, this is not why I'm here. Um, and I actually ended up quitting my job that Wednesday with, without any plan of what I was going to do next. And, you know, it, it took me a bit of time. Uh, I, I knew that there was something here. Um, and then what I realized was that like this, 
this supportive peer community of men uh, that was really actively nursing me back to health in a lot of ways and, and where I had gotten just so much benefit from. Uh, it wasn't really at that moment being replicated digitally. Um, and, and there weren't any safe spaces where it was just simply dedicated to dealing with, uh, you know, a, a lot of the, the stigma and the isolation that men feel and giving men permission uh, to actually feel, emote and receive support from other men. So uh, that kind of, the, the whole idea for Tether ended up coming out of a conversation with a friend, which is another entire different story but I, I had one of these sort of aha moments where I, i'd been thinking about wanting to build something and do something i didn't really know what it was and then all of a sudden i kind of had this moment where i realized that what it was was really replicating that safe uh, supportive space but in a digital format and so that's what we've built with with tether uh, it's a thread-based application uh, where you can go in uh, you actually are prompted and you say like how are you feeling so you select a feeling from from a carousel a wheel and then you go and you actually check in and write what you're feeling that day and then you can see other members of the community come and support you comment reply uh, like we we have a an in-platform uh, 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 I guess it's like kind of a super like on the platform. It's called an honor badge. So if somebody really goes above and beyond uh, with how they share or support, uh, you can hand them one of those. Uh, and then we also allow men to uh, post anonymously for a fee uh, because we want to keep the community open and vulnerable and, and as us. But we understand too that for a lot of guys, you know, sharing as themselves for the first time uh, may not be feasible. And so we want to give them an option too to be able to put what they need out there and get support from the community. And then in other cases too, uh, you know, maybe what they're sharing is a bit sensitive or they don't want to, you know, drag potentially people in from their life if somebody were to see it. So we try and make it so that, you know, as many people are sharing as, as themselves as possible. And that is actually what we find is that most men want to share as themselves. And we've had uh, no problems in terms of any kind of breach of our guidelines or policies or, you know, community uh, uh, values, which is wonderful. Uh, but there are some times when men actually need to be able to share and, and don't want to share as themselves. And so we wanted to be able to provide that as well. And then as we grow right now, uh, what we want to be able to do is, is provide men with the, you know, the services that, that they need uh, in order to, uh, in order to get, you know, both support on a peer side of things, uh, but then, you know, more professional, you know, crisis resources, things like that, uh, that really, you know, make this what I'm hoping to be kind of the, the home base for mental health and well-being for men. Hmm. Amazing. Bit of a long story. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. It's so nice to hear the, a couple of things um, that came up for me when you're talking is one is the, um, this idea of trying whatever it is you need to do to find kind of the healing um, and how I think there's a bit of a gap in our conversation about, and you touched on it too, there's a huge lack of access in some sense, and there's not enough services available. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious, so I'll, I guess I'll lay out a few things. One is, so mm -hmm. there's that, but there's also, I don't think we give enough uh, acknowledgement or honoring to the, how difficult it actually is to confront your fears, face, the darkness inside of you and then take the steps forward to kind mm -hmm. of do something about that. So that's yeah. another part of this, you know, conversation that assumes if there was just more practitioners and more, et cetera, then everything would just change, but I'm not so sure that is accurate. Yeah. Um, although more access is certainly necessary. And I think mm -hmm. one of the awesome things about tether is that it's, an open door in some way for people to get to the point where they might be ready to actually make those steps and take those steps. And we, I would say that's the glaring hole in the mental health service um, industry market, et cetera, is there is not places like that. And that's where it's so, I think I always think of, you know, the addiction recovery, alcoholism recovery community, there's 
there is a place for lots of people to go. Not everybody kind of feels comfortable in a 12 step room or is really open to that methodology. Mm -hmm. um, but at least it's there and it's free. Yeah. So mm -hmm. worst case scenario, you know, I mean, <laughs> if you got nowhere else to go, at least there's somewhere to go. Um, yes. But in, in the, in the more common mental health space, there is nothing. Um, I mean, I shouldn't say nothing, but very little. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm so inspired when people like yourself find, I guess, an, uh, a pathway where you can use your experience, but also your skill set or your wisdom and your intelligence, so to speak, to create something out of that suffering presented to the world and be of service. And that's pretty amazing. Thank um, you. Yeah, it's incredible. It's so beautiful. I mean, those are examples. And you, you also mentioned the modeling, like we need to see each other modeling the solutions as opposed to the pointing our finger at all the problems. Mm -hmm. And so another, whatever it is that you're doing is, or the things that you are doing is an example of that modeling and showing people the pathway, which mm -hmm. is, Fuck, it's amazing, you know? It's so cool. Um, I, and, yeah, I wrote down and one I think that, the, Yeah, uh, and I think, that, I think that's the big piece that's actually missing, right? Uh, and you talk about like, you know, how, how do you get more people to go on, you know, on that journey, right? Because it's not fun, it's not easy all the time. Uh, you know, it's necessary, but it's, it's not, um, uh, but it, it like, it, it takes it out of you, right? And there's times where you're like, how much more, do I have like how much more shit do I have to shovel out of the bottom of this hole? Um, and it's, it's, I think, you know, without seeing like, cause, and, and this is the other thing. It's like when you're in with a practitioner and, and by the way, I, I still go to therapy. So like, you know, I, I'm in yeah, it. I too. love it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So like I, I'm, yeah. I'm all about therapy, but there is a, there is a different type of a relationship where it's like practitioner patient. Right. Um, and there has to be a distance, uh, you know, I think for both the practitioner and the patient, otherwise, you know, when you're dealing with, you know, issues of the mind, it can get really messy. Um, right. And, and so there isn't that feeling like you are on the same level as that person. It's like, you know, you they're here and like, kind of, I'm, you know, down here and I'm trying to get more up to where they are, but like, I'm always going to kind of be it always feels like I'm behind them and, and why supportive peer relationships are so important is because, you know, there's going to be times where you're the one here and they're the one there, and then it's going to oscillate and change. And, you know, there's going to be times when you're both flying high, uh, but it's, there's not this, you know, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm in this position of, I know more about mental health or I know more about recovery or I know more about this or like I'm the authority there's always going to be I think you know somebody who's kind of maybe a bit further on their journey or whatever but it, it's so important that it, it it kind of dislodges that that power dynamic and that relationship and it creates just a normal friendship where uh, and, and this is something that we're kind of playing around with right now where it's like I think it's important that you know I think it's important that we have these within the context of, of rate of normal friendships as well. Right. Like um, I think, you know, peer support doesn't always have to look like, you know, Oh, I'm struggling here. I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to acknowledge how you're feeling, ask a good question, do that. Like, I think these relationships can be very, very normal, but I think what's missing is that there's permission to go to that, that place, right. When it is needed, when you do feel like you need that that sort of little extra bit of support and space that you know that that person is there then willing to go there with you. And you, you can actually say, hey man, you know, I, I am struggling. I, I, I could really use just like, do you have 15 minutes, right? Like 15 minutes to chat or can we schedule some time? And so I think it's really important and that these relationships have healthy boundaries as well. Um, but there's no way that we'll be able to, to you know, tackle mental health collectively uh, if there isn't, 
if peer support isn't like a, a critical aspect of that, um, and, 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 you know, if we're not teaching people how to be supporters of others and, and, you know, we do it in the context of male, male relationships, because men don't do that for each other. Women are usually much better at that because they've been raised where, you know, they have permission to, you know, support each other, be emotional, you know, that is, you know, part of, of how they're socialized and men are typically not socialized in, in that manner. But what I think what I think is missing is like, you know, all we're really trying to do is to teach people to have better relationships. That's it. Right. You know, let's let's sort of just get rid of like, you know, the, like all the terms of like mental health and struggle and stuff like that. What we're basically, you know, saying is like, let's just communicate better with each other. Let's support each other more. Let's let's not run away when it feels difficult or, or you know, yucky or you know dark or whatever and i think that's i think that's the biggest thing is like you know when you're when you're talking to somebody <clears throat> and you start going kind of down this rabbit hole and they're like oh well have you thought about going to the gym or you know eating different or you know this really worked for my friend yoga sounds like really good for you um and and when people you know start suggesting and solutioning um the way that i think a lot of people feel is like they just it's like you're trying to push the person off right you're trying to be like oh just try yoga and like let's please not have this conversation yoga should fix that and then we don't have to talk about this anymore right but where i think we can go is you know by having relationships with healthy boundaries by uh you know teaching people that when you're in one of these relationships it's also about checking in with yourself and whether you are capable of providing support to somebody in that moment like being like is this a day where I can do this? And I, I had a day the other day where, you know, I had to say to someone, I was like, you know, listen, like I, I'm, I'm a bit overwhelmed right now. I don't think I'm the best person for you to speak to right now. Like I, I, I've had to create my own healthy boundaries so that when I do show up as a peer supporter, I actually know that I'm coming at it from a place of, you know, you know, some kind of abundant energy as opposed to deficit. Because if we're always just like, you know, giving out and giving out and giving out, that's also a recipe for, you know, for neglecting yourself. Uh, but I, I just, I think like, you know, what we're really trying to do kind of at its core is like, we're just trying to teach people to have better relationships with each other um, and to not be so freaked out uh, by having a conversation around, you know, struggle. I think it's important to normalize that. Uh, and I hate the word normalize because it makes it seem like this is like abnormal in some way, but, you know, the big thing that's kind of at the core of Tether is that we want to let men know that struggling doesn't make you any less of a man. It simply makes you human, right? And so how do we, you know, collectively hold space for this? And I think that's why it's not just on therapists and it's not just on our mental health system and hospitals and all of that type of stuff. All of that's great, but I don't think that we actually navigate any of this without peer relationships and with you know, learning how we can become more supportive of the people in our lives. And it doesn't just affect men on men relationships and, and those types of friendships. I believe that this type of thing that we are uh, actively, you know, training and modeling on the Tether platform, it applies to your relationships with everyone. So that's, you know, that's why I think we can sort of have an outsized impact, but also by doing it, by focusing on men where there is like very clearly uh, a dearth in these of, of these types of relationships. And so first, we kind of start there, we allow people to kind of get their footing in that community to feel maybe like they've been supported for the first time in their life or really heard for the first time in your life. And then I think the compounding knock on effects of that can be potentially massive. Yeah, beautiful. I guess example of that process of healthy relationships in some sense i think i gotta put a plug in for therapists like if if the therapist yeah. is presenting themselves as a superior intellect so to speak then probably not doing their job very well but You're right. um i gotta like i think I guess my interpretation of that is, yeah, the, the relationship is just different than mm -hmm. a peer, than a friend like it. And, and I, I'm new in that world. So I, I don't think I've read enough on the, on the benefits, pros, cons of 
self-disclosure and all that kind of stuff. And different therapists have different approaches, no doubt, um, which I do find fascinating. And I think the profession, if you will, is moving more in the direction of being less rigid in kind of that relationship. But who knows that aside, <laughs> yeah. I think. And it's tough because like, like I also yeah, don't think that, tough, yeah. you know, it's like, it's a boundary issue too. So it's like, yeah, totally get yeah. it. But yeah. And you, but that's why we need and, both. Exactly. And you mentioned it well too, in terms of the boundary thing, like boundaries are healthy and they're good and they have different, they have different uh, uses and different relationships. Um, what you were describing in terms like, I also, another reason why I was so kind of inspired by listening to you talk about the, you know, I also kind of, and still to this day, I mean, I don't have to do it as much, but will do anything I possibly can get my filthy hands on that I think will help me feel better. Mm -hmm. um, and that's such a huge part, I think, of that muscle, building that muscle of, oh, wait a second, the more I'm vulnerable, the more I share, the more I'm heard and held and supported or, or given positive feedback and guidance, that actually feels good. And I, I can kind of, it's like the momentum, the reverse momentum of the spiral down, you kind of spiral mm -hmm. up. And lastly, my, my sponsor, um, the guy who, pro I mean, that relationship probably even still to this day is the most important relationship in my entire life. You know, I've, mm -hmm. I love my therapist who retired recently, but you know, it was that, per that other guy who I could call whenever the hell I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, he would answer if he could, and if he couldn't, he wouldn't answer, but yeah. it was just that. And he taught me how to be vulnerable, how to be honest, how to be kind of accountable. Um, and all those skills that I yeah, didn't have before. And that's I, I, the beauty of, I think I'm curious what your thoughts are on, you know, in, in a 12 step context. Yeah. The sponsor has the experience mm -hmm. in some sense, so they can sort of be a guide. Um, and mine was very good at that, not telling me what to do, not ever acting in a sense superior than me how how does it or how do you see the peer support models working in that sense of mm. does there need to be kind of that guide learner relationship i don't know does that make sense kind of i know you yeah. have a little knowledge of that so yeah for sure and, yeah. I, and i think it i think it depends on the on the person guiding right i think there'll be naturally people who uh who sort of skew more towards the like you know i've done this for a while so like just trust me, right? Like, and I think there's also, there's also that point, you know, and especially when it comes to like, you know, 12 step programs where, um, you know, I know a lot of it is around, it's like, well, you know, if, if, if this was really working for you, then you and I wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation. Right. Um, and, and that's, that's a way of putting it. And I think, I think that's valid, but then I also think too, that it's like, you want to also give autonomy and power, to that person as well. Um, and so in the context of that, where nobody has a degree, you know, and, and you know, nobody graduates, uh, you know, nobody is fixed ever, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, in yeah, that yeah. type of a relationship, I think it's interesting. And I think it's really incumbent on uh, that person who is leading to also recognize, you know, in themselves where they were as that person. And, and I, you know, I think it's, you know, I, I've, I've had people, you know, I've been in that relationship with a, a person as well. And I think what was so important was that it, it wasn't like, you know, I'm the expert and you're, you're the student, right? Uh, it was that it's like, I've done this a bunch, right? Um, I, I, I feel like I've done this a bunch and I feel like I have a pretty good handle on what's going on here and what might be helpful for you. Uh, but I think it's really important that that person also then can in some ways detach themselves from the path that the person takes. Otherwise it can become like a very, you know, it has the potential to become a, like a controlling relationship where it's like, you yeah, didn't do yeah, this, yeah. you didn't do this, you know, I'm gonna cast you off because you're not checking these boxes. And I think that's a really, 
you know, it's unfortunate if it gets to that point. I, I'm sure there are relationships like that in that context that have gotten to that place. But then I think there's like so many people in those in those rooms, especially where, you know, it is really truly about the service and, and that they are getting benefit for themselves. And so I think it's, you know, really that that relationship is so incumbent upon both sides doing the work consistently because if mm. if the person that is uh you know is let's call it 30 years sober and sponsoring and all of that type of stuff uh isn't doing the work on themselves that's also going to then show in sort of how they interact you know with you and there may be more control or wanting to control and things like that so I think like the success of those relationships are really dependent on both people doing the work. And I would even say that that's true of a therapist as well. Like, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't, I know I don't want to talk to a therapist who's just kind of skipped through life. Like that would be fucking boring as shit. And like, you wouldn't really be able to, you know, understand me or what I've gone through. And it's like, if it's all academic and there's no lived experience, I'm like, I'm kind of like a no to that either. So that's why I think this lived experience piece and 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 being able to, um, being able to uh, allow yourself to be vulnerable enough to say I identify with that I know how you're feeling like the most impactful even professional relationships and I've done you know I've done hypnotherapy I've done energy work I've done all of these different things and the practitioners that I continue to come back to and that I work with most consistently are ones that can identify themselves in what I'm going through um, and it's not saying oh I've been there before you'll be fine uh, it's that you know I can understand why you're feeling stressed angry it seems like you have a lot of grief uh, they're very good at modeling you know, what the other person, what I'm saying in, in, in my case, let's say, or, or, you know, using the words that I'm using to make sure that I feel heard, which is such an important part of any one of these relationships. But I think it's super important in all of these contexts, whether it's like a, you know, sponsorship thing or, you know, therapist, you know, patient thing, or just a supportive peer relationship that both people are actually doing the work. That's how those relationships get, you know, really, really good and really, really beneficial. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately for the people that are kind of like, let's call it, you know, a bit behind, right? The ones that are being more taught and less doing the teaching or the ones that have, are having space held for them and are not the ones doing the space holding. Uh, it's a tough position for them to be in because they don't actually know what that looks like. Right. They don't actually they, they wouldn't be able to tell you if that person is actually doing the work themselves because they're coming from a place of deficit and they're just trying to get themselves up to feeling like somewhat normal. Um, so really what you know what I think this is why this requires a, a much larger conversation and, and why it's so important that you know we do normalize the pain and struggle that comes along with having to get through uh, a lot of these issues. Because if you're not seeing other people, and, and this is why, you know, with, with therapists, like, you know, I would love a therapist to be a bit more like, you know, I went through this, I went through that, because then it, it, it feels like I'm human then. And it's not like, you know, it's not like I'm, there's something wrong with me that needs to be fixed, that's being fixed by this person. It's that we're engaged in, you know, a relationship that's professional, but, you know, where I can sort of identify myself in the other person. And I think that's really the core of it. Um, and that's what kind of allows us to have that feeling in ourselves. Uh, like, it's, it's like, it's like the feeling of a, a full body breath, basically. It's like where your body just feels like it's taken a breath and it releases a little bit. And that's where the identification piece comes in, I think, is like, you know, knowing that you're not alone because mental health can be so isolating. Um, and so because you do oftentimes struggle in silence, right? The darkest moments are not the ones where you're on, you know, you're with someone. The darkest moments are where you're in your apartment, you're watching the TV, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a Friday night, you've got nobody around, and you're just like in it, right? And you're really, really, really in it. Um, and I think the being able to identify yourself in another person's struggle, it's, it, it, it can, it can call back in those moments and be like, okay, you know what, I am okay, I am safe, I can get through this. I know, you know, Mike went through that and he and he told me that story and often it's those little moments where we can identify with other people's stories that allow us to get through those those periods so i'm all about you know more open sharing more normalization 
uh, having these conversations uh, because I think you know we do each other a disservice uh, if we try and hide behind this veil of uh, you know everything's okay I'm I'm doing great yeah I went to the gym this morning and had a kale smoothie and you know I'm feeling a hundred percent you know that 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 can also then go into like toxic positivity as well right um, and so I I just I. I think you know. I think it's really important that we all just sort of own what own what it is that we are feeling when we are feeling it, um, and so and and by doing that, I think we do each other, uh, you know, a much greater service. And I would also say, just like really, you know, your job as a supporter, or your job as somebody who's holding space for someone, is not to fix them. It's not to solution for them, right? The solution comes from actually feeling through like we all intuitively know what we need to do uh it, it just you know we need to to know that it's like you know we're not a bad person because we're going through that and so i think that's the biggest thing is like i always come back to this concept of holding space for somebody which is a it, holding space is very distinct from problem solving you can ask the person if you, you if they want you know some suggestions but the first thing is just sitting with them, allowing whatever they're feeling to be there and saying, you know, acknowledging that and saying, you know, that sounds really difficult. I think if we can all just get a bit better at holding space for each other, a lot of this becomes a lot easier. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> um, that word keeps coming up when I'm listening to you. The uh, when a lot of times when I I guess one distinction in that is this idea of active listening versus people are always like, yeah, be an active listener, da, da, da. I think I, because of a lot of my mindfulness training, we do a lot of practice with just mindful listening, which is actually almost emotionless sitting here and just holding the space. Like I'm not even, doing this, I'm not smiling, I'm not nothing. So the, the individual can one hear themselves talk mm -hmm. and hear themselves feel and be that. Um, and and th there is something incredibly powerful about that. And it takes, it takes the listener, as you kind of said, the listener has to know or has to have been through a, somewhat of a fire or, mm -hmm. or have that that skill set there to be able to give that to the other person, mm -hmm. which is also often, perhaps we just don't honor that reality or how difficult or I don't know what the word is. I just think like, we're not taught to do it. Like we're just not yeah. taught to do it. Right. But yeah. Anyway. But yeah, but yeah. But on that note, like if you haven't experience your own darkness it's so hard to sit and listen to somebody else's i guess that's kind of and yeah we're definitely not taught how to do it and um there's my mind goes in so many directions but the yeah one one thing about you know in reference to kind of men and this storyline with men on being open to sharing and is it, i think in the common discourse the assumption that men should be more open is flawed. Um, I mean, ideally, yes, but <laughs> in reality, it's not so simple. So there's that part. And I know Brene Brown, who speaks to this so nicely, she says something along the lines of, for a man to be more vulnerable and open, the woman he's sharing with has to have done her own work. Mm -hmm. Because the similar to what we're saying now, like the woman or man or whoever, the person is just going to want to deflect, as you were saying, like want to problem solve and want to yoga. <laughs> I can't remember the word you used, but it was yeah. so good. It was just, yeah, <laughs> like that's not going to work. So mm -hmm. the listener in some sense does need to have some sort of experience in in sitting through their own darkness so that they can hold the other person's honesty or, or whatever it is they're sharing mm -hmm. um 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I was going to say one other thing. I'm a little bit worried about my charger here. Okay, that's good. <laughs> like, I don't want the computer to shut off. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, kind of. I, I think I think on that yeah. side, yeah, I think on that subject, it's like, um, you know, I think it goes both ways, right? And like, you know, I think this is why, you know, it's taken me so many years to be in a relationship is because, you know, I haven't necessarily been at a place where, uh, you know, I, I was able, like, I, I was, t I, I, I would need to take more than I was capable of giving. Um, and I, I think I'm still working through that, that phase as well right now. Um, but, you know, listen, nobody's going to do the work for us. And I think, you know, so often, yeah. um, I think so often, like, you know, we want other people to change to fit our needs. Um, and, and that is a completely unrealistic and flawed way uh, of, and, and, and I don't even think that we do it consciously. I think it's entirely subconscious that we're, you know, we're like, you know, we say, well, you know, if, if this person just behaved a little bit more like that, whether it's a partner, a parent, a sibling, a, a, you know, a coworker, whatever it is, it's like, if they just didn't do this or did this, then this wouldn't be an issue. And it's like, no, it's not about what they're doing. It's about your ability to actually tolerate it. Right. Um, and I think that that comes then back to the holding space piece. Right? where it's like, it's not, you know, it's not your job to fix it. It's, it's, it's about your job to be able to manage yourself in the context of that discussion. Right. Um, and, and that's where mindful listening and all of this type of stuff comes from. And it's why I think we're so bad collectively. And this is not just like, this is not just women or men or, you know, it's like, it's all of us. I yeah. think as a society, we're just not great at holding space for each other. Right. Yeah, because, yeah. because when, when somebody's darkness comes up, it's reflecting the darkness in you as well. And so, you know, we have these things in our brain called mirror neurons. Right. And it's why we cry at sad movies or laugh at comedies. Right. We're seeing something. And then there's a part of our brain that registers that and then feels it within ourselves. And so, you know, if we can't identify what's ours versus theirs, yeah, then these conversations around struggle and whatever are going to affect us because it's going to bring up that and, and we're going to not, we're going to be like, why am I feeling so uncomfortable having this conversation? Why do I just want to get, you know, fuck out of here? And it's because it's, it's bringing that up in you because they, you know, you're literally mirroring what their experience is. And so if we're not able to be mindful, if we're not able, if we're not doing the work ourselves, we have no way of actually being able to separate ourselves, what we are experiencing from what they are experiencing. And so like, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'll often do when I'm talking to somebody is like, I will literally repeat in my head, this is not my stuff. This is not my stuff. This is not my stuff. Because like, I'll feel that tightness in my chest. And, you know, someone will be like, I'm so anxious, this and that. And I will feel it resonating through me. And it's like, you're, you're kind of like in this, like, you know, this pole in the ground that's like, you know, drawing in electricity. And if there's no way to ground yourself, then that's just going to keep going through you. And it's not going to find a way to actually get through you as well. And so I think it's really important. Uh, and and I, I, I don't know, I, I, I think there's some people who can probably do this naturally. I don't think there's a lot of them. Um, but I think it's really, and this is where doing the work on yourself then creates that healthy identity that you are then separate from. And this is my stuff. That is your stuff. I am not responsible for that. I am responsible for this. And I think the deeper we go into this work, we, the, the better able we start to become at identifying what is ours versus what is not ours. And then by being able to do that, uh, you're able to actually then hold space for others and not have it affect you as much, right? And so going back to what I was saying before, right? And why, you know, whether it's in a, a sponsorship relationship or a therapeutic relationship or a peer, a peer relationship, it's always incumbent on both people, you know, showing up and doing the work themselves, especially in the case of the person who may need to be more supportive. It's really incumbent on them to have those healthy boundaries, to have done some of the work on themselves, all of that, because otherwise it's, it's, 
it will be impossible for them to not get entangled in it. And if they are entangled in it, they're immediately less objective and less able to actually hold this space. And so, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, this is kind of playing off of your, the, the Brene Brown thing that you were talking about is that, you know, I mean, she's mentioning women in the context of men and what you said, but it goes both ways, right? Like if, if one person isn't, capable of of you know of holding space for themselves or is able to identify what is theirs versus what is not theirs the whole exercise is going to be problematic and, and this is why i'm like we're not taught how to do this and the big issue yeah. is that we're just simply not taught how to do this and that's also part of what we do with tether which is you know we we're giving people uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, pillars and ways that they can actually engage in this. And one of the pillars that we have as part of, you know, the way that we provide peer support is checking in with yourself before you go and do it. Like, it's kind of the first step. It's like, am I actually capable and uh, able to show up right now? And if not, what do I need? And it's always very important. I think, you know, uh, I think, you know, we talk about it's like being supportive and it's like, but yeah, but you can't be supportive and then, and then dive on the sword. You just like, you can't, you can't sacrifice yourself. It doesn't work because then somebody's going to need to like, you know, come pull you off the ground and that's not helpful either. So I think it's really important that like all of this work, um, and you know, any kind of supportive relationship, whether it's with a spouse uh, or a coworker, or whatever, is all incumbent upon us doing the work ourselves. And and you know, I mean, that's where I am. Like, you know, I I want you know deeper, more meaningful relationships. You know, I want a family one day, and I still feel like I'm breaking down some walls in terms of my ability to hold space for myself and really, mm -hmm. you know, be able to uh, reconcile and 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 feel everything that's coming up for me, which is like overwhelming a lot of the times. And, and so that's where my edge is right now is like really, uh, you know, being able to hold that space for myself. And I think once we're able to do that, it becomes a lot easier for us to do it for, for other people. And I think that's where, that's where the real growth and resiliency comes from. But then also like, it's a, it's a deep and profound connection to yourself, which also feels really great. Yeah, so much wisdom um, coming out of you there. The, the beautiful part or the realization when you can <clears throat> kind of stop expecting other people to change so you can feel better mm -hmm. is, is, is that is a huge one. And one that, again, we don't teach each other very well or we don't learn that. that that's mm -hmm. a really difficult skill that is a lifelong practice, I think, at least for me, for sure. Mm -hmm. I know kind of a lot of my personal work was around that kind of, how, how do I stop expecting the world to change so I can feel better? I mean, that's kind of the whole starts with me is that's the essence of that message is like, I got to look here first. And if I don't mm -hmm. look here first, then I'm not going to get anywhere. Um, and then once we develop those skills, then yeah, we can sort of share it with others. And there, there's a distinct boundary there. You also mentioned kind of the idea of this isn't my stuff. And that's, that's a skill or a practice for sure that, man, the world would be, would be a much better place if we could all learn that a little bit better. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, there, I guess I, I've been kind of, this thought keeps popping into my mind because you've said a bunch of things around it and we talked about it in the, in advance is the, the self love or the, I, I love, like I've done a lot of practice in self compassion stuff and the, mm -hmm. which I think is similar. Um, and you mentioned to this idea that I'm not alone or being able to identify yourself in another person's story and et cetera. And the, I think a huge gift for today's world is self-compassion and the practices are so powerful and helpful because they allow us, I think, you know, the three components are common humanity, loving kindness, and 
God, I'm going to forget the other one. It doesn't really matter. But um, just be compassionate sort of with idea. yourself for forgetting. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 no kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is difficult for me right now. You also mentioned that idea. Of, yeah. I can't remember if it was when we were talking or not or before, but I loved, I, I do it all the time too. And when I'm leading meditations, I always offer it up. It's just, can you touch yourself or like, Put your hand on your heart or, or mm -hmm. where can you bring yourself a sense of being held? Mm -hmm. um, if you can't, if, if it's not working sort of through the meditation practice, you can actually touch yourself or hug yourself or feel yourself. And that is mm -hmm. a sense of bringing that sense of um, comfort, which is, a, is profoundly beautiful. And in, mm -hmm. in a way, the self-compassion practices, at least the ones that I've been trained in so to speak there's a distinction between the masculine feminine energy mm -hmm. which i think also in the conversation around sex and gender and all these issues we've just so messed up and not clearly yeah. artic you know discuss with each other and part of the is that internal boundary of do i need kind of the more masculine you could use the yin yang example yeah the more yang kind of forceful go away stop no kind of thing or do i need to be held more right now do i need to bring myself some mm -hmm. kindness and softness and soothing touch um which kind of i think at least for me was once i could identify what was my shit and what was the other person's then i could start to clarify oh wait a second I actually need, oh, you also said another thing, what do I need right now? That's mm -hmm. another beautiful part of the self-compassion stuff is, yeah, what the hell do I need right now? Or what need yeah. is not being met that I can meet for myself or ask somebody else for help? Mm -hmm. um, and it's certainly layered and deep and it's never necessarily straightforward, but yeah, the more we practice, the more the answers come, I think. And, uh, I think there's, I think what you're like, yeah. there's a lot there around, like, I think self-compassion too is different than self-love. Like one's forgiveness. Yeah. Um, and then one is like an active practice of, you know, actually, you know, loving yourself. Right. And uh, I mentioned to you before Kamal Ravikant's book, uh, love, love yourself. Like your life depends on it, which is like 50 pages. You can burn through it in like an hour and a half. Uh, but he has a practice, two practices that he shares in the book. One is uh, sitting for seven minutes in meditation and, and, you know, breathing in and saying, I love myself and then breathing out and imagining all the blocks to self-love going out with the breath. Um, and I've had like, you know, doing that for seven minutes, like, you know, I feel, you know, just in, in energized and, and revitalized and, and it's really started to help me break down a lot of the uh break down a lot of the uh the walls that i had and then really my own my own the the biggest uh, i would say you know resistance to my own personal growth has been self-love and self-compassion like those are the two things at their core it's like you know if i could be more compassionate towards myself and just tell myself i'm doing the best i can a little bit more my life would be so much easier if I loved myself, like I would be able to love my work more. I would be able to love my relationships more, right? It really, I think it, it really all does sort of start with ourselves and, and with that. And I'm just really starting to, I think, break down a few walls around self-love. Like this has been a, it's been a lifetime journey so far. So to expect that it's going to happen in, in a few months or a few weeks or something like that, just isn't necessarily realistic, but you, you find it's like, as you start to actively practice that it, it, it starts to move a lot quicker than, than you think it would. Um, and, and I, and I want to also touch on that idea of like the fam, the feminine versus the masculine and, and, you know, so much of like self-improvement and, uh, you know, the, listen, I love guys like, you know, Tom Bill, you and, and like, I think there's good stuff to like David Goggins too. And like all right, this, right, right. but, but it's all, but like, basically it's like, fuck what you're feeling. Right. And yeah. just keep grinding and keep pushing. And I think that that is shit. 
right? Like, I think there is a time where you can, like this morning, there was a, a moment where it's like, I had been lying in bed for longer. I could feel like, I'm like, okay, I'm in a cycle. Like I'm, I'm in a, a spin cycle in my head. It seems like I'm like, I'm feeling low. I'm like, you know, you know, in my bed, like the sheet is like over here. I'm not comfortable. I'm just there. And, and I'm like, okay, we need to get up and go get a fucking coffee. Like we just need to get out of the house, right? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah we need yeah. we need to move, right? Like we need to <laughs> yes, like not yes, be here yes, right yes. now. And so that yeah. I think that's perfectly valid, right? Because like there is sometimes when you Beautiful. just need to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. you just need to say to that little guy, it's like, all right, buddy, time yeah. time to gang. I promise you, you'll feel better after we get out of here, right? Yeah. Uh, but for the yeah. most part, I don't feel like and and my one of my coaches actually, I'm gonna quote two of my coaches and bring this all together so one of my, the coach that I currently work with is a guy named Chris Wilson who works uh, who runs the unshakable man um, and he's my personal like men's emotional awareness coach and he talks about the difference between force and power right um, and and force is like what I think when I see like David Goggins and and uh, you know you know Tom Bill you and uh, you know uh, uh, Tony Robbins and all of that type of stuff. Like a lot of that I feel like is force, right? And I think power only comes from letting the feminine lead. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So I have a, another teacher that I work with as well. And she always reminds me that everything is born of the feminine. Um, and it's true, right? Like we come into this world born yeah, out of yeah. the feminine. Um, and so, but what that means is that it's like, first you must hold space for yourself, right? And the feminine is the one that holds the space. It's the one that is the container, it's the womb. It's all of those concepts, right? Um, and so I think men kind of like really fuck this concept up in their brains because immediately they hear the feminine and they're like, oh, no, 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 I'm a man though. And it's like, no, no, I get yeah, it too. Yeah, yeah. You're a man, got it, but you're, you're missing the point, right? <laughs> And, yeah, and what it yeah. really what it really is is like it's like it's learning how to create and hold that space for yourself and so that's why meditation is so powerful especially first thing in the morning right because if like for me as somebody who deals with like you know panic attacks and who has a hard time getting out of bed who feels the weight of the world many mornings when they're when they're trying to get up and get going feels resistance because it just all feels too much like that's that's a sign like I'm not going to be able to force myself through that right or at least if I do I'm really ignoring some really critical things that are going on inside me and so I need to start from a place of okay man what do you need right now and and often and like for me I think this is where inner child work comes in I know I'm layering in a bunch of stuff here but like really when there's that you know that tightness in your chest that racing mind whatever I, I believe for me that that's always that there's like this little wounded inner child that is, is calling out for something and he's overwhelmed, he's scared, he's afraid, uh, he's anxious, he doesn't want to do it, he, you know, he's afraid of what other people will think. And, and I think, you know, it's like a, it is like a screaming child, right? Like if, if, if you just say stop screaming, stop screaming, stop screaming, I mean, I'm not a parent, but I feel like a lot of my friends who are parents, like, they're like, I just tell the kids to stop screaming. And he just like, it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Like, at, at some point, we have to just be like, hey, why are you so upset? Right? And we need to do that with ourselves, right? And, and realize that these are two parts, like, these are like there's we're not like that's not us right there's all of these different disparate parts that are kind of going on within us and so just if we can acknowledge that there is this part of us that didn't get certain needs met there is this child that you know was wounded in some way and that looks differently for for everybody but if we can if we can um start our days you know or or in those moments uh you know, sit with those parts of ourselves and say, hey, what do you need right now? It's like, oh, I need a hug, or I just need to be listened to, or I'm feeling really scared, and I need reassurance. Like, we need to parent ourselves. Like, the anxiety, the fear, all of that type of stuff, I believe, is just this, like, little kid inside of all of us that's 
scared, afraid, you know, doesn't want to do it, doesn't want to go to school. Like I, I often tell, you know, that was one thing that I used to say to people when I was like in a really bad place and I was working right in, in finance, I was like, fuck, I just don't want to go to school today. And that's what it felt like, right? It's like, I just don't want to go to school. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, I think it's so important. And, and when we can actually hold space for ourselves and for that wounded part of us, right? And be the, the, the mothering influence to that, to that child and say, hey, it's okay. I, you know, it's totally okay that you feel, I would feel scared and, and upset. And just like sitting with that and allowing that to be there. What I found is in that practice, eventually something transmutes, right? There's this thing that that, that child feels seen, that child feels heard. And then that actually unlocks this reservoir of power, right? And then you actually like, it's like that, okay, well, what do I need to do? Okay, I just need to fold my laundry. I'm gonna fold my laundry. And that's not coming now from force. That's actually coming from a place of power where that part of you feels seen and is therefore more fully integrated. And now it's like, it's like, you know, okay, do you have your juice box? Do you have your, your apple slices? You're feeling good? You're locked in the, okay, I can go do my thing now? Okay, perfect, right? It's like, literally, it's like, does the kid have his juice box? Does the kid have his apple slices? Does he feel calm? Okay, now I can, now grown up Mac can go and actually do something, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's such an important thing. And, and I don't think we give ourselves enough time to actually go through that. And sometimes all it takes is five or 10 minutes. But when I've actually been able to implement that consistently and actually allow myself that time, even if it's in a busy moment to actually give myself that, I just find I'm so much more productive afterwards. Um, and, and then, you know, it's just like the rest of my day flows so much easier from that space. Um, so there's a lot there, but I think, you know, just sort of summing up, it's like self-compassion, like the ability to forgive yourself, so important. Self-love, that's an active practice. Like we talk about loving our, you know, self-love. I think it's something that, you know, I'm learning. It's something that needs to be actively done. Um, and then this idea, it's like the, the, the feminine, you know, it, you know, is in front of the, of the masculine in the sense that you need to give yourself that space, that forgiveness, that compassion, holding that for you. And that's really what's going to then allow you as a man or me as a man to really step into that yang energy of like getting shit done because that, that part of us feels seen, heard, acknowledged, cared for. And so I think it's like, necessarily one comes after the other but you know and and by acknowledging both that's where we come we become like sort of more more fully integrated and and uh, you know able to oscillate between those two energies which are you know for all the guys that don't want to hear that they have feminine energy in in them I'm sorry you know i'm not going to be the one that tells you it's there tap into it it's so valuable and it's actually gonna, one of the things that I like, you know, the, the phrase is like, you know, uh, a, a soft front for, but a strong back, right? It's, uh, that's kind of like, you know, what I aspire to in terms of how I can carry myself through the world, soft front, strong back, which is like, I'm here to hold space for you, but I also won't be pushed around, right? And I think yeah. that can only, yeah. in a healthy way, and not like in a fuck you, you can't push me around way. It's in a healthy way yeah. where it's like, it's it coming from a place of like, I know my boundaries, like this is where they are and I'm here for you and I hear what you're saying, but like, this is where sort of I stop with this or I, yes, I am willing to give this to you. Um, but it, it that can only, and, and some of the strongest men that I know are the ones that have fully integrated these pieces of masculine and feminine and do carry themselves with the soft front, but the strong back, my coach, you know, Chris Wilson being one of them. Um, and, and, you know, there's a number of guys that come through that, you know, every man live lineage as well, uh, who have, I've had the fortunate, you know, you know, ability to actually begin to get to know a little bit better. And, and that's really where I see it. it's like true masculine embodiment is this soft front, strong back, but it comes from integrating both the ma masculine and the feminine. And that, that shit takes time <laughs> for sure. No doubt. Yeah. I love that soft front, strong back. And I even think, you know, I even say this to my kids too. And I model it maybe sometimes too much, but sometimes like, it's totally okay to be like, back the fuck up. Like, yeah, um, you know, like 
after, you know, as a, as a, we also are kind of scared of that anger, fire, or like that healthy, assertive boundary kind of yeah. holding it. Um, and our kids are just, uh, like all my work and I've done a lot of work in the schools and, and we're not teaching kids how to honor the masculine energy in them because mm -hmm. we see it as bad in some sense. Yeah. Um, and it can be for sure, but it, mm -hmm. I love that soft front, strong back. I got to remember that one. It's a good one. A yeah. Really good one. And, the, and for the third, oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. Go, go for it. No, 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 no. please. Okay. Uh, I, I no, was, okay. I was just yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. It's, no, I was yeah. just, it was a small <laughs> point on, it was a small point yeah. on like, uh, you know, it's like when boys are over anxious, it's like, you know, it's ADD or, you know what I mean? Like we, we don't let them sort of embody that, you know, thing. It's yeah. like, oh, they're boys, they're rambunctious. That needs to be calmed down. Well, you know, right, you right. know, you need to like allow them to actually do that and and be that and like fully embody that part of themselves. Yeah, like if they're if they're you know pulling you know other kids' hairs and you know hair and like, <laughs> their face in the mud and stuff like yeah. that. Okay, that's a learning opportunity. But like you know, like you know, just because they're rambunctious or energetic or you know, whatever, like, does not mean that there's something wrong with those kids. And I think it's like, we do need to give children more liberty to express and to, but it's not, it's not unbridled. It's that it's yeah. like, oh, you're feeling angry, right? Not being like, stop being angry, but like help them identify that they're angry, help them identify that they're sad. And it's like, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be sad. Why do you feel this way? You know, what is coming up for you right now and allow them to actually go through the process of expressing, because if, if you don't allow them to then express why they're feeling angry, why they're feeling sad, whatever, you're just saying, stop being angry, stop doing this. It, they're just pushing that lid down on top of it. And, and that compounded over many, many years, you know, is, is, you know, why you and I are talking, right? <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah, totally. you know what I mean? It's like, those, like, we need to give, <laughs> we need to give them an opportunity to just like, like fucking talk about what they're feeling Yeah, and, yeah. and not make yeah. them feel like bad because they're angry or bad because they're sad or bad because they, you know, they, you know, got a little bit rambunctious and jumped off a piece of like playground equipment. And we didn't like that because we were then afraid, right? It's like, I, you know, stop doing that. Cause you're making me afraid. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's like, totally. no, you it's, know, you need to learn how to not be afraid or like be like, yeah, mm -hmm, if my kid breaks mm -hmm, his leg, mm -hmm. then, you know, okay. And like, I'm also talking from this, from the place of not being a parent yet, but like, it's something that I'm, actively looking forward to and something that I do consider I don't know if I'm I'm definitely not going to be perfect like you know I'm not I'm not saying <laughs> no, that no. but I think you For know sure. one of the things that I intend when I do have children at some point down the road is to like at least be mindful enough to be able to ask them the question of why they are feeling that way as opposed to just sort of immediately being like stop it um and yeah a bit of a tangent yeah. but yeah no, it's so good. I mean, it ties into the other stuff we were talking about in terms of it's and, and teachers, you know, lots of good teachers out there, but some maybe not so much. Um, it's that the parents or the adult caregivers can't handle their own shit. So they're, mm -hmm. you know, expecting the child to behave in a certain way so they can feel better, you know, and it's, yeah, you know, I, I, as a parent, for sure, there's days where you just are like, just fucking stop, just like, shut the fuck up and yeah. stop, I'm gonna lose my mind. Yeah. But it's about the, uh, the modeling and also the repair, which is another big thing, at least on the parenting note is, hmm. if you do behave in a way that's not congruent with kind of the person you want to be or the parent you want to be, it's just owning that and telling them that and kind of apologizing and sort of moving on from there. That's a, another big one on the parenting side. But um, that third component of self-compassion was mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And I, that, that kept popping into my head. And it's, you know, forgiveness is, can be part of self-compassion, but it's such a nice tool, I think, at least for me too, when I'm 
speaking of my kids, when my kids are freaking out or when I'm having a hard time with their behavior, I go to the self-compassion right away and just kind of, oh, this is so hard for me. This is difficult. I can't do this right now. I don't want to do this. I have my little little boy temper tantrum that you were speaking so nicely yeah. to, you know. And then, yeah, from that nice, you know, if we use the energy words, that feminine energy of being held, then I can take action. And that, mm -hmm. I love also what you spoke about. Just yeah, we hold ourselves first, and then the action follows. And that's mm -hmm. uh, that's a profoundly helpful practice for me too, and one that. I try to practice as much as and, I can. And I think that's also a key component of stoicism as well. Um, like, you know what I mean? Like, I think people get it wrong. Like stoicism doesn't mean that you don't feel emotions. It's that yeah. you're able to act in spite of the difficulty and yeah. like, you know, the, the feeling that's coming up. And um, I think it's so important is like, you know, people talk, you know, about like, you know, especially when it comes to that piece, I think there's a lot in that philosophy as well, where it is, you know, it's, it's, it's acknowledging that inevitably there's going to be things that happen that are difficult for us and that we need to, you know, transcend and, and move through and what have you. But the key thing is, is like, are you actually giving yourself the space to feel what's coming up and then yeah. acting from a place of like, okay, it's okay that I feel this way. It is okay that I'm afraid. It is okay that I'm overwhelmed. It is okay that I want to, you know, uh, punch my child in the face, right? Like all of that is, is okay, right? That does not make me be a bad person, a bad father, a bad whatever it is. It's like, okay, I acknowledge that I'm feeling this way and what do I have to do? Right. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. so, yeah. that's so important um, because if, you know, and it's in, and it's not just with children, it's in our relationships with like, you know, uh, my parents and I, like, you know, I didn't get to, you know, this place without not having some shit happen with my parents and having challenges there as well. And I think, you know, the, the old joke, obviously, is that, you know, if you think you're enlightened, go spend a weekend with your family, right? Um, and I think for, for me, one of the biggest things that I've learned is, you know, is like, there's so many of these patterns that then bring up this stuff in us, these really old, yeah. deep, heavy things. Um, and it's like when those things are coming up and it's like realizing that they're, they're not saying something to like harm me or to, you know, to not be supportive. Like, it's like, they're just doing the best that they can with what they have. And so like, I think, you know, being in a place where we can constantly just like, breathing like you know I, I think you know dropping into our bodies and even you know breathing while people are speaking and like taking that right deep breath when you're just like you can feel it coming up and you're like okay not my stuff not my stuff right and and if we can then and if we're doing the work on ourselves then we can actually be like you know what i love you exactly as how you're showing up right now and then, and, and that's when we start to actually have like that measure in our thing. And it's like, listen, I totally get where you're coming from. I think I'm going to do this, but I, I can tell that you really care for me or I can tell that you're really concerned. I'll be okay. But like that, that you're only able to have that response if you're actually able to hold that feeling within yeah, yourself. Yeah, because I think what yeah. so often happens in our relationships is like that fire comes up, especially in our really close relationships. We don't know what that is. It's uncomfortable. And then we just like, we pounce as opposed to be like, okay, I'm angry, frustrated. This is not what I want to hear right now. <sighs> okay, breathe. This is not, this is not my shit. This is their shit. And like, if we can just take those few deep breaths that allow us to separate from the emotion and realize that it's a feeling and things like that, you know, all of a sudden we, we just respond better, better to people in our lives, to everyone. Um, and, and, and that, that process repeated, you know, many, many, many times over time is then what, you know, creates that person who just looks like they can just like, you know, you know, they're 10 foot tall and bulletproof, right? But it's like, it's yeah, really yeah. that they have done that consistent work where, you know, those people that just have a presence and then just like walk into a room and hold the space, right? And you're just like, whoa, that person's different. 
you know, and, and from my, <laughs> in, in my, in my experience, a lot of those people, uh, especially in the type of work that we do and, and in this space are the people that are doing that work for themselves and that have that really trained into their brain because they've just done it over and over and over and over again. Like, you know, uh, and, and that's why practicing with our families too is so important, but Anyway, now I'm rambling a little bit, but I think, yeah, it's, okay, it's, yeah. it's so, yeah, it's, great, it's so, um, it's just like take, and this kind of, I think this whole conversation is really revolving around this concept of holding space. And it's like, there's two things. It's like holding space for yourself and holding space for others. And you cannot hold space for others unless you're capable of holding space for yourself. And yeah. that's why I think everyone's having such a hard time right now in COVID because it's just the energy is so heavy. We're locked yeah. away. We're being forced to like actually sit with and see our shadows, right? There's just, there's, there's, we don't have the same kind of distractions that, that we used to. We're not able to go out. We're not able to do the things that we used to do. And it's like, we're being forced to finally face that. And I think that's been the hardest, you know, the, the, the virus aside and, and how horrible it's been for, you know, people in who are frontline workers, people who have lost parents, uh, you know, just de generally disrupting our lives, people who are dealing with, you know, prolonged symptoms of it, all of that, yes, that, you know, that's awful. And I think for a lot of people, what's coming up right now is just that it's like, this is all this stuff that I've been trying to distract away for years and now I can no longer not look at it. And so the only way that I've been able to move through this period, which has been exceptionally challenging for me as well, um, building a company and figuring out myself and all of the stuff that's kind of come as part and parcel with that. Um, the only way that I've been able to do it is like actually just sit with myself and be like, it is okay that I feel this way. And sitting with that until that part of me actually feels heard and seen, uh, and then there's a loosening and like just doing that process over. There's just no, there's no way to, to, to bypass that. It's like mm -hmm. the only way, the only way around is through. So. Yeah. 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 I often say there's no shortcuts, but there's many solutions. And uh, on that note too, of the, I remember kind of when I was, working through a lot of things with my wife and my kind of early recovery is sometimes when I would get triggered, there's another saying, uh, families push your buttons because they're the ones who put them there. Yeah. Our family is such yeah. a good one. The, I would honestly need, sometimes I would need a, a one or two day timeout where I would actually not, I'd be so caught in my own, well, not caught, but I'd be working through my own stuff mm -hmm. that I, I actually couldn't speak or formulate a sentence or a thought because mm -hmm. I was so full of discomfort that I just couldn't think clearly. And that was okay. That's what I had to do. That's a prolonged time out. But now sometimes if I'm noticing and being really mean to my kids when I'm like not in a good space, I'm the first one to be daddy needs a timeout and I just turn the other way and I leave because yeah. I'm just going to continue not to be nice. And so, mm -hmm. man, it's all, I, I, you know, I guess we've been talking for a while. I don't know what your time is, but how are you doing for time? Yeah. Yeah. I've got a few more minutes for sure. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, I'm curious. I'd love if you kind of what, what your, or, you know, what tether, is working on I yeah. mean beyond what you've already done and kind of mm -hmm. where you see this going and um, any other kind of things on that note where uh, yeah where you think you're going and I just I yeah. also want to say before I forget is um, it's so nice to see I, I've sort of sat on a lot of panels and on these things on sort of social advocacy or how do you turn your own experience into advocacy or all those types of things and i might my thing is it always has to start with you and your own personal work and it's mm -hmm. so anyway it's just so nice to see you or it, it 
it's obvious that you have done uh, so much of that and that you're engaged in that and you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's, that's a, an inspiring thing to see. So amazing on that. Thank you. And, and, and I would say that I, it's like, I have to do that to survive. Like I can't, mm -hmm. I, I won't survive otherwise. Like it's, it's just absolutely critical um, for me. And thank you for, yeah. for acknowledging that I, I kind of lose that, you know, that yeah, yeah. you know in myself i'm like okay yeah no i am like i am trying mm. i am doing stuff right for myself and 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 doing the best that's the other big one it's like you know i'm doing the best i can today so thank you for um acknowledging no, it's that. beautiful I, i'm i'm learning a lot by hearing you and it's just it's lovely to see so good stuff thank you yeah and in terms of yeah. like where we're going i mean yeah i kind of mentioned it before it's like you know i want to be a, a platform uh, where men can connect with other men, they can get access to, you know, the services, you know, products that they need to support their mental health and well-being, um, you know, want to be able to provide people with crisis resources if they need it, train people uh, to be able to, to be an effective peer supporter, effective communicator, uh, basically to have better relationships uh, with each other. And, uh, you know, I think there's a real opportunity for us to not only be a, a platform that provides a, a safe space and services, but then also, uh, you know, as advocates uh, of this work. And what's been really the the nicest part of this was is is how supportive women have been of of what we're trying to build. And it's like it's almost kind of like they're just like, oh my god, thank you for showing up. Like, please take my fucking, you know, take my brother, yeah. take my husband, take my father. <laughs> like, oh God, for Christ's sakes, it's been too long. Here you go. Um, which is but like I, I think like intuitively women understand what it means to have supportive peer relationships. They're just so much better at doing that than we are. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and I think like, what's so interesting is like, I, I see a lot of women, like, you know, my mother, my grandmother, a lot of my female friends, and I'm just like, oh my God, they are so much more resilient than men, right? In a lot of ways, women are so much more resilient than men, probably in most ways. Um, and and it's, I think, I think part of it also comes from the fact that they've been allowed to feel their emotions. Like I think resiliency, comes from actually being able to go to the depth of your emotions and come back from it right in a healthy yeah. way yeah um yeah and so you know i i just you know having women be such strong advocates of ours has been like really you know such a blessing and and i know that there's a way that you know we can just sort of like you know take the take the men the people that identify as a man into the community give them a space where they are connecting you know based on shared experience uh, they're finding other guys who are on the same journey. Um, and, and then what I hope really long term is that, you know, we're doing just our, sort of our small part to heal the relationships between everybody uh, on the planet, right? And whatever that looks like, because, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, if a guy then goes in and is able to start building these relationships with other men and sort of sees how important and meaningful, it's like, there's no way that that doesn't carry out to his relationships with, you know, whoever that is, right? You know, whether it's at work, partnership, uh, whatever that looks like, these things have externalities to them. They compound on themselves as well. Um, and I think collectively, you know, when one person starts to heal, the other person starts to heal as well. Like it, it can't be in isolation. You can't have a person who's suddenly becoming more integrated um, and then that other person stays the same. Like they're either kind of forced to change or the relationship changes in a lot of yeah, ways yeah. right and that's yeah. also like i've seen that as i've started to do the work on myself like you know my relationships with the people around me have changed and for the better um and it's progress and the the, the one that struggles the most is obviously the closest relationship is with, with my parents but even that relationship is so much better and so much different uh, than it was uh, before I started, you know, doing this work. And so what, what I want us to sort of be long term is like, you know, yes, I want to be a platform where, you know, men can get access to uh, supportive peer relationships, expand their networks, meet other guys, where we're actually teaching this to the world, right? Where it's like, we're, we're normal. Again, I hate the word normalized, but like, we're normalizing this, Right. And that, you know, on some level, I'm kind of hoping that the guys that are on Tether that are using the platform 
uh, you know, may even impact guys that are not using it. And they don't necessarily even need to come to Tether, but it's like maybe just by guys doing that naturally in this, they can start to then bring it to the other guys in their lives. And then it just sort of creates this, this compounded effect, right? Um, so I think that's a big part of it. And then also just, you know, again, coming back to what our North Star is. And I think that that is really deeply instilling in men that, you know, struggling doesn't make you any less of a man, it simply makes you human. And that's really kind of the core ethos that we that we have. Um, and it's our guiding North Star, right? It's like, if, if, if we can, as a company, work towards that, right? And there's a number of ways that, that that statement sort of shows up in terms of, you know, how we show up, what we're trying to build, how we interact, right? Like that, if we can sort of stick to that, I think the rest of it, you know, takes care of itself. But, you know, we're doing this work. There's a ton of organizations that are also starting to do this. There's, you know, you know, men's work communities all over the place, Every Man Sacred Sons, Modern Renaissance Man, there's like uh, Mankind Project. Like this stuff is starting to grow and expand. We're still very much in with, in, in the infancy. And so for, for my big goal is just, I just want to be a part of the growth uh, of that and the spreading of this work so that, you know, tether may not be for every guy like there's going to be guys that want to use tether there's going to be guys that want to use another service product whatever uh, but what i do think that we do very very well is that we can be that entry point right you know because for us the entry point isn't necessarily even you sharing on the platform it's simply you setting up an account and just looking and seeing that there are other men having these conversations. Just that alone, I think, can be such a transformative first step to know that you're not alone. Um, and so for us, I think what we're doing really well um, is, is we're kind of becoming like, like the peer support guys. Um, and then we're also serving as that like very clear entry point into this type of work or, or just taking that first step around like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to finally acknowledge that I don't feel like I'm okay. Um, and I need to do something about this because I don't want to keep living like this. So like, I would say for all of you guys that like feel that way, uh, right. That like, just feel like something's not quite clicking with inside of you or there's stuff that's come up that you've just wanted to tell somebody for a long time if you just feel like you want to be heard and, and acknowledged and honored for for showing up exactly as you are that's where tether really comes in and so you know i invite anyone that's listening to this or any guy that's listening to this for the women please share us with the men in your lives and for the guys you know just set up an account don't have to post anything you don't have to reply you don't have to comment you know uh you don't have to do anything just go in and take a look Take a look what's there and see see if you feel compelled to be part of the community in a more fulsome way. What I can tell you, uh, what I can guarantee to you, uh, is that it's not going to hurt and it might help a lot. Amazing, thank you, Matt. And and so all the social handle handles are tether for men. Is that right? At tether for men. Yeah, at tether for men on Instagram. At tether, uh, it's uh, you can just search T E T H R uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, at, tw at, at Tether for Men on Twitter. So, you know, we have a, yeah. we're, we're on Facebook, we're on all of these different platforms. Uh, you can download the app in the App Store. Uh, you know, we're going to be building an Android version uh, in the near future. So, you know, for all of those people that, you know, have been waiting for this and want it, you know, for Android, it's coming, we're going to get there. Um, and then, mm -hmm. yeah, some, some more exciting stuff coming, I would say, in the next three to six months and uh, really looking to, to you know, build more into the platform so that there's there's more for guys to do on the platform um, and and more ways that we allow them to you know check in with themselves check in with others support each other support themselves uh, and just sort of have that that mobile community so it's like wherever you are you know if you're feeling that tightness in your chest that anger uh, you know whatever that is if you're feeling that we want it to be something where it's like okay I can go check in with tether I'm gonna go post about what I'm feeling, drop it out, you know, just get it out of yourself, right? Like that's the really the most important reason why this needs to be mobile is like, you know, you should have access to support 24 seven, wherever you are, there should always be a way for you to have like some kind of an avenue to drop something out into the world where you know that you're going to be getting support, love, care, 
uh, uh, you know, back from that. And that's really what I think we want to be. Uh, not what I think. That is what we want to be for, you know, for anyone that identifies as a man. Beautiful, beautiful thing. Hmm, I'm getting some uh, goosebumps and tickles. Ah, feels yeah. good. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for your time and and for your work. You know, I think one thing you said too, which was so nice, is just the, just the act of being helpful, helpful or of service or loving or modeling. That was another thing we talked about a lot. That the 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 what do they call it in economics the trickle down effect of that yeah. is endless yeah. yeah and so it's just amazing so thank you and uh keep up the great work thank you so much mike and thank you for having me again